Well, the Portland Alliance has been bringing progressive community news and analysis to Portlanders for almost 15 years now. Uh, we're just delighted to see this audience here tonight, and we are especially pleased and honored to have with us tonight a man who is no doubt our most famous subscriber. Uh, <laughs> In his writings, uh, Professor Chomsky emphasizes the importance of local movements and local struggles and how essential it is to build popular democratic movements if we wish to ever create a more just and peaceful society. With characteristic humility, he downplays his own role as a thinker, writer, and spokesperson for the left. Analysis, study, research, he acknowledges he can do those things, and in his own words, reasonably well. But the more important work, he insists, is being done by those who are working actively to create a better world. I still remember several years ago during a fundraising drive uh, for the Alliance when we got our first contribution from uh, Professor, Chom Professor Chomsky. He's been a loyal subscriber ever since, and in fact, I brought his renewal form for him tonight. Uh, <laughs> hoping that he would uh, pitch in again. We have always appreciated his support as a significant affirmation of the work that we try to do. Professor Chomsky's work is inspired by the multitude of movements for social justice around the world. In turn, his work informs and inspires those of us who are actively engaged in those movements. It goes both ways. He has written about how his activism has enriched his life because of the people he's met, the friends he's made, the things he's learned. We too are enriched by his presence in our community. It's hard to think of a more principled, determined, and tireless proponent of authentic democracy around the globe than Noam Chomsky. We are very thankful for his support over the years and for being here tonight at this benefit for the Info Shop and the Portland Alliance. Enjoy the evening. Sorry, I don't mean to steal all the limelight here. There is one more group that I'd like to thank very much, though, and that is the Flying Focus Video Collective. They're <laughs> These folks are going to be taping the event tonight. All right, thank you, Flying Focus. At this point, it is my sincere pleasure to introduce Professor Noam Chomsky. Got to leave me the renewal form. How am I supposed to? <laughs> uh, not well organized. <laughs> uh, for about uh, 20 years now, the country has been moving in a very obvious direction with quite uh, ominous overtones. It's sensed quite clearly by the general population with deep and growing and quite justified concern. The general contours of it are clear enough so that they're being described uh, not only in technical literature but even in popular literature that reaches the public. Uh, you can see what's going on just by looking at very gross statistics. Uh, in around 1980, the United, uh, if you look at things like, say, level of inequality uh, in, in the United States, it was more or less like other industrial countries worse than some, better than others. Now it's by far the worst in the industrial world. Uh, the levels of inequality are back to what they were in pre-depression days. Uh, if you look at things like, say, poverty rate, uh, the United States was always f somewhat high. It's now about twice as high in poverty rate as the next 
highest country in the industrial among the industrial countries, uh, and you get the same. If you look, to, I'm going to take say uh, a proportion of the population in prison around 1980. Again, the U.S. has always been on the high end. Around 1980, it was about the same as the next highest country, which is in the industrial world, which is England. Now it's the incarceration rate has gone way up. Crime rate's been pretty steady, but the incar incarceration rate has shot way up. We're out of sight, unrelated to any other industrial country. In fact, any country. Uh, past South Africa and Russia back in the 80s, uh, Russia finally caught up with us after the reforms uh, set in and they started learning how to do things right. So we're in, I think we're now second, but unrelated to the industrial world. And the same is true on, ish on measure after measure. Uh, child malnutrition, um, all sorts of things. Uh, these are shifts uh, which are too obvious not to be noticed. Uh, and they are noticed, and they're real, and they're frightening. Uh, if they're very strongly opposed by the general, general population, uh, which so far has not found a uh, constructive response to them, uh, if they continue, the effects for the United States and indeed for the world are indeed pretty grim. Given our power, we drag everyone along with us, uh, more so in a more globalized economy. Uh, the move is towards a kind of a third world structure. It's as if the United States is becoming something like a third world society. Uh, now, third world societies differ among themselves, but they have some structural features in common, and those are the that's the structure towards which we're moving. Uh, tip, pick, you know, typical third world society, you know, Mexico, Brazil, um, Indonesia, you know, Egypt, you pick it, uh, typically ha has a small sector of often extreme wealth and privilege. Uh, that's even true in the poorest societies. There's enormous wealth, uh, in fact, astonishing wealth, very highly concentrated. There's a large mass of population which is in bad shape, suffering or often in deep misery. And there's a superfluous population which just um, has to be either driven away or killed or something, subjected to social cleansing in places like Colombia, uh, send the death squads after them, do something or other. Uh, and that's what we're becoming like. Uh, the equivalent in our society to uh, social cleansing is in fact the uh, huge growing prison population. Uh, now. When this, this is described, then it's considered to be somehow a kind of an inexorable process, you know, the laws of um, capitalist econ international economy or a consequence of automation or something like that, something that's kind of out of control, just happens by natural law. Uh, I don't think there's any reason to believe that that's true. Uh, these are specific human decisions. They're made in a certain institutional structure for particular reasons. It's perfectly true that the decisions are being made because of conditions that exist that makes it possible for them to be made. But uh, the, continuation, the, the, the continuation of these processes neither comes from technology or from some you know, un immutable properties of an international economy or anything else. They're well under control if we want to control them. Uh, so far, they are not being controlled, and that's what's uh, so dangerous. Uh, the, uh, uh, I'll talk about specific cases as we proceed. If there's time, we'll talk about things like automation and others. But I think if you look case by case, you see that there's nothing inevitable at all in what's happening. Uh, what's happening is the result of specific, is deliberate and conscious social policy. Uh, in who's carrying it out, well, in a narrow sense, the government is carrying it out. Uh, but there are a couple of truisms that are worth bearing in mind. Uh, one truism, which was expressed clearly by the leading 20th century American social philosopher, John Dewey, uh, is that politics is the shadow cast by big business over society. Now, that ought to be a truism that kids learn in fourth grade or somewhere. Uh, it's obviously the case, and Dewey went on to say that, uh, make the, draw the obvious conclusion, uh, that uh, uh, unless you modify the substance, in other words, if you carry out reforms of the shadow, the basic problems will remain. It's worth doing it, but the fundamental problems will remain. It's the substance that has to be changed. Uh, that goes all the way back in American history, in fact, to the founding of the, um, of the Republic. Uh, if you go back to the 
Constitutional Convention, 1787, uh, the, the fundamental question that was debated was to how to reconcile two irreconcilable things. One was the desire to construct some sort of a, maybe the most democratic society in the world. On the other hand, and the other thing that was un irreconcilable with that was uh, what were called the rights of property. And James Madison, the main framer of the Constitution and the major thinker whose views, in fact, were uh, incorporated into the way the constitutional system was designed, made it very clear in the debates in the Constitutional Convention that uh, democracy is not tolerable because it will undermine the rights of property which have to prevail. The prime responsibility of government, he said, is to uh, protect the minority of the opulent against the majority. And the system has to be organized so that that's the case. Uh, in the words of the uh, president of the Constitutional Convention, the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Jay, uh, the country should be governed by those who own it, period. That was his favorite maxim, according to his biographer. Uh, and that's the way it was designed, and that's the way it stayed. I mean, there have been a lot of changes over the last couple hundred years, but those fundamental principles remain, and they are furthermore recognized. If you look at the um, sort of elite theories of democracy right up till the present, that's the principle that on which it, that is the core doctrine that has to be preserved uh, in a democracy. If you take somebody like, say, Walter Lippmann, the uh, one of the leading 20th century American intellectuals and the sort of dean of American journalism, who's noted for his uh, what are called progressive essays on democracy in a sort of Wilsonian style, uh, he said, "Yeah, we have a democracy, and in a democracy, the people have rights. Uh, they have the right to be spectators." Uh, they have a right to be spectators, but not participants. Uh, the population, he said, are ignorant and meddlesome outsiders. Uh, they're too stupid and ignorant to take part in things. Uh, since we're democracy, we let them watch what's happening. Uh, but that's it. Uh, the, the, the decisions have to be made on the part of what he called the responsible men. And he didn't add the fact, and maybe he was unwilling to acknowledge the fact, that you become one of the responsible men if you're willing to serve the substance that's casting the shadow, uh, as Dewey put it. Then you're one of the responsible men, and yeah, then the outsiders, these meddlesome outsiders, uh, will continue to be participants. And that runs right up till today. Uh, that's the way decisions are made. That's the way they're supposed to be made. There's struggles and variations, and things change, and gets better or gets worse. Uh, but that's pretty much the course of history, not just here, but uh, everywhere with particularities depending on the society and the culture. Uh, this uh, combination of circumstances that we're now living in, what's considered to be a right-wing takeover, but remember that's speaking of the power centers. The population is overwhelmingly opposed to it. Uh, that's pretty easy to demonstrate. Uh, but that takeover is, uh, ha has happened before. It's happened repeatedly before. It's always been temporary. Every time it's happened, it's been called something like the end of history. Uh, sometimes words virtually like that. Uh, uh, and greeted with great you know, pleasure as a kind of utopia of the masters finally arriving uh, with the population, with the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders marginalized and suppressed and following orders and you know, uh, wealth concentrating in the wealthy and so on. It's never been true in the past. Uh, there's no reason why it should be true today. Uh, those, again, are matters of decision and choice, not inexorable processes. Well, the United States is so rich and so privileged that even the most deliberate social policy uh, could, would have a pretty hard time turn, turning us into something like a third world country in absolute terms. That would really take efforts, and one wouldn't expect that to happen. It's more the structure of the third world countries that we're, we're approaching. Uh, the uh, uh, how wealthy and privileged the country is is often not quite recognized, uh, and it's worth bearing in mind. Just to give one indication, uh, the American colonists in the 18th century uh, had levels of uh, health and life expectancy that were not matched by the upper classes in England until early in this century, and they're the next most privileged group in the world, uh, let alone the general population there or elsewhere. Uh, if uh, by the, the United States ought to be 
uh, far ahead of the world uh, in all the measures that I described and others, infant mortality, uh, access to health care, uh, elimination of uh, poverty and malnutrition, and on down the list. Uh, we ought to be far ahead because of the enormous privileges and advantages that we have, which are really unusual. Uh, in fact, as I mentioned, the United States is a near or at the lowest level in the industrial world in most of those measures, and that gives you a very clear testimony as to how well the economic system is working. Uh, by rational standards, it's a very serious failure, uh, if not perhaps the absolutely catastrophic failure that you find when you look at U.S. domains, uh, places that have been under our influence, uh, uh, namely at the parts of the world towards which we are heading or being driven more properly uh, in structural, if not absolute terms. Incidentally, these are more truisms, uh, which also ought to be taught in fourth grade or somewhere. Uh, and the fact that they are not perceived, at least by the educated sectors, I think they may well be in some form by the mass, by the stupid and ignorant majority, uh, but the fact that they're not perceived that way by the educated sectors, and there's also some talk about the enormous success of the system, that tells you a good deal about the intellectual culture, uh, as does the fact that the uh, principles on which the country was founded, which I just illustrated of, from a small sample of a big set, uh, as is the fact that those are not commonly understood, uh, emphasized, and at the core of our uh, educational system. Well, as I said, none of this is a big secret. Uh, at least the description of what's happening is not a big secret. The reasons for it, you can debate. And I think the reasons that are given are wrong. Uh, the, just to illustrate, uh, any, any day's newspapers are just adding further and further, um, often dramatic testimony to this to illustrate both the way it's, both the facts and you know, the way they're skewed a little bit. Uh, let me just take the last couple of newspapers that I saw, national newspapers, just before I flew out to the West on uh, yesterday morning. Uh, so that means Friday and Saturday national newspapers. Uh, uh, the uh, Wall Street Journal Friday had a lead story which was about the uh, uh, congressional actions on, on the medical system, on Medicare. Uh, here, I'll just go through the headlines of it, have a series of headlines and make a comment on each. First headline says unequal treatment, which is accurate. Second headline says Medicare bill passed by House would end egalitarian approach. Half accurate. Uh, for reasons of logic, uh, you can't end something unless it exists. Okay, <laughs> And there has never been anything remotely like an egalitarian approach, so it can't be ended. Uh, but the point is sort of accurate, despite the falsification that's implicit in it. Uh, whatever, to the extent that there was anything remotely resembling an egalitarian system, which was pretty remote, uh, it's being ended. Uh, next uh, subheading, the wealthy stand to gain. Absolutely correct. Second, the poor may be hurt. Almost correct. You just have to change may to will. Uh, and you have to recognize that poor is a kind of term of art. It means most of the population. Uh, it, uh, next comes the other half of that falsification, trade-offs for the middle class. Yeah, trade-offs for somebody. But when they talk about middle class, they're talk talking about the top few percentile right under the super rich, not the people in the middle by any means. Uh, then comes the final question, the final part of the headline, it reads a question. It says, is health care a basic right? Well, that question is not answered, uh, but it's worth looking at. Is health care a basic right? Well, here there are actually two answers. Uh, one answer is uh, the factual one in practice. In practice, of course, it's not treated as a basic right, and it never has been. Uh, in fact, worse in the United States than I think any other industrial society, despite our enormous wealth and privilege and what there was of a right is now disintegrating or being removed because these are conscious, deliberate policies, not inevitable ones. Uh, so at the level of practice, of course, it's not a basic right. Uh, what about the, at the level of rhetoric, or for that matter, even the level of law? Well, there it is a basic right. Uh, you'll recall about uh, a year and a half ago or so at the Vienna conference on 
there was a conference in Vienna on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, with a big controversy between people called universalists and people called relativists. The universalists held that the principles of the Universal De uh, Declaration of Human Rights adopted by the UN unanimously back in 1948, uh, that those principles are inviolable. You can't distinguish them. They're all, you can't just say some of them we're not going to pursue. Those were the universalists. Then the relativists were the bad guys who said, you know, we're only going to follow some of them, we're not going to follow others, like, say, China, which, you know, wasn't going to follow the principles and say you have to have free elections and things like that. Uh, the United States was leading the defense of the universality of human rights with great fanfare and pomp and, you know, many uh, exalted uh, editorials uh, talking about our magnificence and standing up for the universality of the Universal Declaration against those third world relativists who were trying to say that some of them don't apply. Well, uh, among the universal human rights listed right up there along with uh, freedom from torture and the rest are the right of health care, uh, right along uh, the right to other social services, uh, to security, to adequate food, to clothing, to housing, to proper working conditions. Uh, all of those are fundamental human rights guaranteed by the Universal Declaration, rejected only by relativists of whom we happen to be in the lead because about half of the Universal Declaration the United States just rejects flat out. Uh, it's kind of intriguing that in all of the huge flow of self-congratulatory rhetoric about this, that fact if it was noticed, it was very marginal. You'd have to look very hard to find somebody noticing that. But it's true. And at that level, yes, health, the access to health care is a fundamental human right. There is no question about it. In fact, the principles of the Universal Declaration uh, have been upheld in U.S. courts as binding customary international law. So it's rhetorical and indeed legal, except it's just a joke. Uh, the, uh, uh, because the people who own the country and therefore govern it, uh, the people who cast the shadow that's called politics and their institutions just made the decision that these are not human rights. So the answer to the Wall Street Journal question is dual at the level of practice. No, health care is not a basic right and it's getting worse and worse. At the level of rhetoric and indeed even law, sure, it's a universal human right and we are committed to it. Uh, committed and, in fact, full of self-praise for our commitment our, and our defense of the universality against all comers. Uh, but putting all this together, uh, the basic message of the Wall Street Journal headline and the story that follows is reasonably accurate. The wealthy stand to gain. Almost everybody else is going to be harmed, what they call the poor. The rhetorical commitments are into the wastebasket. Uh, that's the basic headline. Uh, and that's what follows as we are driven by conscious policy toward the kind of third world model. Again, not because of any laws of uh, global economics or automation or end of work or anything like that, but by specific decisions which can be made this way and indeed are being made because of contingencies that make it uh, possible to carry them out, but don't have to be that way. Well, that was the Wall Street Journal. Uh, let's move over to the other major national newspaper, the New York Times. Uh, headline in its lead story was public hospitals facing deep cuts, uh, with, uh, which are going to affect primarily teaching programs and services to the poor, which they're targeted for elimination or a very sharp reduction in the poorest and most underserved neighborhoods. They happen to be talking about New York City the richest city in the world, uh, with the worst inequality, probably of any city. Inequality in New York City is on the level of Guatemala, which has, is not only the worst in the Western Hemisphere, but is the worst in any country that provides statistics. That's New York City. And it's being cut. So when you cut or eliminate services to the poor uh, there, it's a lot of people, and they're going to be hurt very, very badly. And it's not just that they happen to be talking about New York City, but uh, the same is true in many places, like take, say, Boston, where I live, which is a rich city and a you know, big hospital center, medical center, and so on. Uh, it has one city hospital that's, that serves the general population, the poor, you know, Boston City Hospital downtown. 
A uh, couple of years ago, Boston City Hospital had to establish a malnutrition clinic because they were, for the first time, getting cases of children with third world levels of malnutrition. Uh, they also started doing some studies of, you know, like a lot of studies, to prove what you know is true, but at least to prove it in such a way that you can publish it in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Uh, so they did studies looking at the factors that led to the rise and fall in mal of, mal of uh, severe malnutrition among children, and big surprise, uh, shortly after it was correlated with the, with the average temperature. So as the temperature went down, and Boston has pretty cold winters, uh, as the temperature went down, a couple of weeks later, the malnutrition went up. Well, you know, not a big mystery. Uh, as the temperatures go down, uh, parents have to make that agonizing decision about whether to heat the home or feed the kids. And that's not an easy decision to make when you're being pushed to the wall. Uh, so, yeah, you got to keep some heat there, everybody will freeze to death. Uh, so, therefore, malnutrition goes up. Correlation is very good. Uh, that's in the richest, most privileged country in the world. Conditions like this are unheard of in, most, in the, any remotely comparable country. That's Boston, and we can run through much of the rest of the country that way. Uh, the next national newspaper that I saw, the Christian Science Monitor, its lead story is on the tax cut, which it says, headline, will benefit mainly the middle and, the up, middle and upper income Americans. Again, the term middle is used here in that Orwellian sense. In fact, if you look at the details, it'll benefit mainly the extremely rich and some sectors a little bit below them. Uh, the rest will be harmed. Uh, and that's obvious from the provisions that they then and everybody else reviews. So cuts in the corporate rate, uh, cuts in estate taxes, cuts in capital gain taxes, uh, which constitute half of the income of the top 1% of the population, then falling off very rapidly, even through the top, through the top few percentiles. Uh, that's, uh, the New York Times also reported the tax cuts and another story. Uh, in an interesting way, they said it opens by saying that the Republicans are following through on their promise to provide relief to American families, first sentence. Uh, so, you know, therefore, at least we have to give them credit for fu fulfilling their promises. Well, if readers go on and get to, say, the last paragraph of this story, uh, they will discover that uh, the uh, 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 bipartisan a joint uh, taxation committee of Congress uh, just estimated that the tax relief for American families that was promised and here given will in fact raise taxes uh, for half the American families. Guess which half? Uh, the bottom half of families will have their taxes raised by this tax relief for American families, uh, while of course they will greatly benefit uh, the the people who own the society and are making the policies, uh, the very the super rich. Uh, there's incidentally a lot of talk these days about a flat tax, and it, unless there's a very major re reaction to it, it will be enacted. It's moving along. Uh, that discussion of the flat tax typically, maybe always, omits a certain interesting fact, namely the tax is already flat, and it has been flat since the Reagan years. In fact, it wasn't very different before. Uh, if you look at the whole range of taxes, it's already flat because we have a highly regressive tax system. Uh, not only does the United States have the worst level of poverty in the industrial world, but if you look at the effect of taxes on reducing poverty, it has the worst record. So if, if you ask how much is the poverty level overcome by the tax system, we're the worst in the industrial world for that. And the reason is that the tax rate is, is effectively flat, that is highly regressive. Uh, so if there's a move toward what they're calling a flat tax, that'll make a very regressive tax radically regressive. And that's worth bearing in mind. It's very much like what, what's called welfare, uh, another one of those Orwellian terms. What's called welfare is that small component of transfer payments administered by the state that happens to go to the poorer part of the population. If you look at the whole range of those transfer payments, which ought to be called welfare, uh, they go overwhelmingly to the wealthy sectors. Uh, the more wealthy, the more they get, uh, in ways which are often, which go indeed way beyond the 
occasionally discussed category of corporate welfare. That's the small part of it, and that is occasionally mentioned and condemned, though never changed. Uh, but there are other much more crucial ways in which that happens. I'll come back to it. Uh, what about the Medicare Medicaid cuts again? Uh, somebody's got to pay those costs. I mean, people get sick, unless you just leave them to die, somebody's paying for it. Uh, so, for example, uh, say, take the elderly. Uh, one out of six of the elderly are suffering from malnutrition. It's not as bad as it is among children, but it's pretty shocking for a wealthy society. Uh, well, that's going to get worse, because what kind of public support they get for medical aid is being cut and everything else is being cut, so it'll be worse. So what happens to them? Well, maybe their children will just leave them to starve or you know, send them off to the North Pole or something, uh, maybe. But if, they're going to take, if somebody's going to take care of them, it's going to be the families, which means it's, in effect, another tax uh, and a very regressive tax, highly regressive tax, and another technique for re redistributing income up upwards. So cuts in Medicare and Medicaid are not... Uh, uh, you know, saving the medical system or anything. They're just another regressive tax, you know, another way to make sure that the poor subsidize the rich even more than they do now. And that's pretty obvious when you think it through. Uh, the New York Times, in fact, that day had another story about a tax hike for the poor, uh, but it's not called that. Uh, this tax hike for the poor is a 20% increase in subway and bus fares. Well, that's just a tax, almost directly. Uh, the people who pay, who ride subways and buses in New York City, who are not the super rich, uh, they are going to pay 20% more, which means their taxes are going up. Uh, now, to be fair, uh, it's also going up for the executives in the suburbs who ride the commuter rail lines, but less than half of that is going up 9% for them. So another regressive tax rise. Uh, in the background are some other facts not mentioned there. Uh, that the state has just cut about $86 million uh, from the public funding for buses and subways, and it has increased by $12 million the funding for commuter rail lines. Uh, the ratio of public subsidy to those rides is about 10 to 1 uh, in favor of the rich. Ten, to one, 10 times as much subsidy for a commuter rail line ride is for a subway or bus ride. That's incidentally pretty common in public transportation systems that have been studied around the country. These are all highly regressive taxes masked, so you don't see them as taxes unless you look a little bit. Uh, the, uh, uh, by and large, the tax measures, all of them, you know, when you decode them and disentangle them, are simply making an already very regressive system much worse. Well, let me finish up the last, you know, the last Friday and Saturday's papers with my hometown, again, the Boston Globe. Uh, Boston has a conser moderate conservative governor, uh, William Will, considered a moderate Republican. Uh, he, uh, the preceding week had had a series of pretty remarkable stories, each one a headline story in the Globe, about attacks by Governor Will against uh, children and poor people, which are pretty remarkable in character. Uh, and you can tell which gallery he's playing to, uh, the gallery of hate and fear. Uh, so one measure uh, was that it was legislation saying that if a, a teenage mother doesn't go to live with her parents or her husband, maybe some abusive relationship that she's trying to flee, then their chil her, they'll be cut off welfare, meaning her children can starve. So you go back to an abusive or intolerable relationship or your children starve. It's called conservatism. Uh, another one uh, said that uh, people will be kicked out of homeless shelters, meaning their children will be kicked out of homeless shelters, if they don't act the way the governor decides they better act. Uh, uh, for example, uh, they gave a couple of cases. And one mother who uh, has a mentally retarded child uh, took off a day to take care of the child, kick him out of the homeless shelter, you know, because uh, that's not acceptable. Uh, mentally retarded child can sleep in the streets this year. A disabled vet uh, who didn't want to move his uh, three children into a well-known drug den, he's kicked out because according to our value system, that's what he's got to do when he's told. 
It's not that he has any choices. Like it's not that he has a job or a home or in sport or anything like that. Uh, and uh, you know, welfare recipients have to be fingerprinted. That's because we increase the surveillance power of the powerful state that the so-called conservatives call for. So they really control people very carefully. Uh, he, they rescinded a state law which barred the social services from informing the INS, the Immigration and Naturalization Service, of evidence that people might be illegal. Well, that's a crucial law because otherwise it makes the social services simply a punitive system which is working for the Immigration Service to deport people, including deporting American citizens because their children are born here. So they're American citizens, but they're going to be deported. Uh, under the new law. Well, there's a series of these things that went day after day, but the Saturday there was a relief. Uh, the governor shifted gears, and this time the lead story was about new legislation to hand over $1.4 million of public funds to racetrack owners, uh, while meanwhile eliminating a pittance uh, that went to a program to combat, to, to treat uh, compulsive gambling. Compulsive gambling is, of course, an addiction. You know, it's kind of like heroin or something, and a very serious one and very harmful. Uh, well, all of this is this subsidy of the racetrack owners and the effort to eliminate the tiny program for treatment of people who are addicted in very harmful ways to themselves and their families. That's another part of a much broader program, the attempt to expand the gambling system. And the gambling system is just another tax on the poor. Uh, who goes to the racetrack? Uh, well, you know who goes to the racetrack and you even know why. Who takes part in the state lottery? Well, you know, not people in Governor Weld's income level or mine for that matter. Uh, the, these are ways of getting the poor to pay more so they amount to another tax. And so it's not that the rich don't indulge in gambling. They do, though it's usually not called gambling. It's called things like, say, speculation against currencies or something like that. Uh, and they don't need any uh, treatment to uh, stop compulsive gambling because it's really not a danger to them. Uh, if they get in trouble, the nanny state is there to bail them out. Uh, so their compulsive gambling is fine, and then they can always go hat in hand, as in the SNL crisis or the Mexico bailout or whatever, uh, if, the, if, it, if something went wrong. That's the point of having a powerful state that's at the service of the rich, uh, which is the so-called conservative uh, image. Incidentally, if any genuine conservatives existed in the United States, they would be appalled at what has happened to that honorable term and conception. It's been uh, dragged through the mud beyond recognition. These are reactionary statists. There's nothing to do with any recognizable form of conservatism. Well. That's just the latest news, you know, what hot off the press before I left. Uh, and it indicates with very, very great clarity where we're going. And I'm sure that the next week's stories will be approximately the same. Uh, surely the business press is not at all in doubt about it, and in fact is quite euphoric about it. So here's Business Week a couple of weeks ago and its main story. Uh, it says, the Gingrich Congress represents a milestone for business. Uh, the uh, never before have so many goodies been showered so enthusiastically on America's entrepreneurs. Uh, that's true. Uh, of course, those goodies come from somewhere. They don't like fall down from heaven. Uh, and they don't tell you where they come from right in that story. But there is an indication in a little tiny item hidden somewhere else in the same issue of Business Week, uh, a little item which is headlined, The Hard Hit U.S. Worker. And it goes on to describe how the share, I'm quoting it, the share of national income devoted to wages has reached a new post-war low. Uh, the uh, decline for the fifth successive quarter, which is absolutely unprecedented during a, a recovery or probably any time. The growth rate under Clinton is in fact considerably higher than it was under Reagan, which was not high at all by reasonable stand by modern standards. Uh, but while it's going up, wages continue to go down. The uh, share of national income devoted to wages is hitting new lows every year. Uh, the median income is going down. Uh, work hours are going up. Benefits are falling. Uh, those are the results of the social policies that I've been talking about and that people know about. Uh, well, the headline of all of this stuff is return to the trenches. <laughs> 
That's the one about the goodies being showered on the American business beyond entrepreneurs, beyond any historical precedent. Therefore, return to the tr trenches, meaning it's not enough. Uh, the feeding frenzy has to continue. Uh, that message is being sent to the 20, 23,000 corporate lobbyists in Washington. That's up from a, under 700 about 30 years ago, which is part of the one of many indications of the scale of this enormous escalation in class war that's been taking place over the last 20 years. Uh, a measure 700 to 23,000. You look at corporate lawyers, approximately the same, and so on. And the ta uh, these lobbyists, incidentally, who are uh, pressing for carrying out these programs, they're also being paid for by the taxpayer. Uh, their costs are kind of like, ad they're like advertising costs. Take them off as a business expense, meaning the public is paying for the lobbyists uh, who are working out the techniques to shift power and wealth even more radically toward the rich. Public is paying for the privilege of being, uh, of being harmed severely by corporate lobbying, just as the public pays for the cost of advertising, meaning for, 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 for being propagandized, uh, which is exactly what advertising is. Uh, well, what are, the, uh, what are they supposed to do when they return to the trenches? Well, they explain. Uh, first, they've got to make sure that the sharp cut in capital gains taxes goes through, as is happening. Uh, secondly, they have to ensure that the process of lowering decision-making down to the state level continues. You want to weaken the federal government, so let's have block grants to the states instead of federal standards. Uh, there are conditions under which that could be a move towards democracy but not under the, under the current circumstances in which private power, which is just pure tyranny, unaccountable private tyranny, is being enhanced under those conditions to move decisions down to the state level is simply to guarantee uh, that uh, the power of private tyrannies will be so awesome in comparison with the state that they can make sure that the money that is technically going to block grants will find its way into the pockets of the rich. It's much easier to intimidate a state and play one state against another than it is the federal government, uh, which is the point of all of this. And it'll go back to the pockets of the rich by one or another device, uh, tax cuts, subsidies, tax increases like the kind that are taking place right now and called something else, and so on. This is a very efficient way to dismantle what remains of the hated uh, human rights that are guaranteed by the Universal Declaration to which we proclaim our endless dedication. Uh, another thing they've got to go back to the trenches for is to ensure that tort reform goes through. That's a fancy way of expediting corporate crime. Uh, the uh, reasons for that are pretty clear. Uh, for example, if you look at the leading corporate funder to the uh, Gingrich Army who's lavishing the benefits, uh, the leading corporate funder is Philip Morris which badly needs protection from its victims. It's one of the biggest killers around, uh, and you want to make sure that people have no protection against its depredations, and then cross the board. Uh, the next, and in fact related, enterprise is deregulation. Uh, now deregulation also includes uh, eliminating uh, the ability of people to defend themselves against corporate crime, actually, as if front page story about this in the New York Times giving some interesting details of what's expected. Uh, deregulation, they're talking about the securities industry, but it's true of everything else. Uh, the deregulation proposals are, uh, uh, their effect, and you look through the details, is to make it easier to, to defraud people. That's the effect of deregulating the securities industry. Uh, it uh, makes it harder for people to defend themselves against fraud and abuse and so on. Uh, the regulations that are being proposed, according to the Congressional Budget Office, will actually double or triple the burden of bureaucracy. So it's increasing the federal bureaucracy by an enormous amount. It has nothing to do with cutting down the federal bureaucracy because there's way more fraud cases to pursue and all sorts of complicated ways of doing it. So their estimate is it'll either double or triple the bureaucracy, but that's not a problem because you just won't fund the bureaucracy. The uh, Securities and Exchange Commission just won't get funded. So you increase the capacity for carrying out fraud and crime uh, you increase the bureaucracy, which has to regulate it, and you make sure that there isn't any funding for them so they won't do it. Well, it doesn't take a genius to figure out the consequences of that. 
Uh, and the same is true of the consequences of other forms of deregulation. So deregulation, eliminate the Federal and Drug Administration, and not long down the road, you'll have another thalidomide crisis. Can't predict exactly which one, but it'll be one of those. Uh, deregulation of for, in, in, in environmental areas, well, everybody knows what that is, uh, so we don't have to talk about it. Uh, deregulation could well increase short-term profit, but with very serious costs, costs to the economy uh, and costs to the general public and surely costs to future generations. Well, that's, uh, that's the next. Incidentally, while all of this uh, fuss about deregulation was going on, uh, there was a, another little side item that you know, you find it on some other page in some other newspaper. Right in the middle of it, last December, uh, George's Bank was closed. George's Bank is the richest fishing area in the world, right off Cape Cod in New England. Uh, and it had to be closed because the ground fish were destroyed by overfishing. That's a very recent thing. It's happened in the last 15 years. And the causes are very clear. Uh, in the early 1980s, as part of the Reagan re Revolution, uh, the, re the regulation of fishing was basically eliminated. And since these are guys are conservatives, that was combined with subsidies to the fishing industry. So you transfer public monies into the pockets of the rich, and you eliminate the regulations. And what happens? Great surprise. Uh, they destroyed the, fish, the fishing grounds, or may have destroyed them. Anyway, the stock is so low that nobody really even knows if they can be recovered. And New England is now importing its cod from uh, Norway. Uh, up in Olympia the other day, yesterday, somebody told me that the Pacific Northwest is, all, is importing salmon uh, for similar reasons. I don't know that myself, but I'm sure you know. Uh, well, yeah, sure, that's the effect of uh, deregulation combined with subsidy. SNLs are actually a very similar situation. Well, remember, we have a conservative governor in Massachusetts, uh, so as soon as the Georges Bank was shut down, uh, he immediately went to Washington to get the nanny state to bail us out, bail out the fishing industry. Uh, why? Well, he appealed for this to be called a natural disaster, something beyond human control. Uh, why was it a natural disaster? Well, because some kind of predatory fish, uh, which has so far been undiscovered because it's pretty, you know, <laughs> elusive type creature, uh, got into the fishing grounds and wiped out all the ground fish. So therefore, it's a natural disaster, so the taxpayer ought to pay for it, like the Mexico bailout and the SNLs and, you know, nationalization of Continental Illinois Bank by Reagan and so on and so forth. You get into trouble, there's always the nanny state to bail you out. Actually, he didn't make it that time, but uh, if the conservative revolution goes on, he'll probably make it next time. Anyway, back to the trenches. Still a lot of work to do. Uh, the... Uh, this is all part of the enormous escalation of class war. And the business press is also exulting about the results so far, which have been quite extraordinary. Uh, so profits are described as dazzling or spectacular or stupendous. Uh, Fortune magazine, which every year has an issue devoted to the Fortune 500, this year was just euphoric. It was the fourth straight year of double-digit profit growth greater about 54% profit growth for the Fortune 500 with virtually no sales growth, about 8%, and, even, and almost invisible uh, job growth, about 2 or 3%. And that's really spectacular. And uh, remember, the Fortune 500 now, they say, control about two-thirds of the gross domestic product of the United States. That's bigger than the entire economy of Germany or the United Kingdom. And in addition to that, it means a big share of the global economy. That's a concentration of private power, unaccountable private power, that is, of totalitarian, unaccountable private power uh, that has, I don't know if it has any counterpart in history, but if so, not a lot. Uh, meanwhile, uh, wages, as I said, are going down, real wages, family income is down uh, for what are called unskilled workers, which is like 70% of the population. Uh, there's about a 20% decline uh, in income since around 1980 when this process really takes off. A uh, striking indication of what's going on is the change in wages for your first job, entry-level entry wages, first job you get when you enter the workforce. That's down since 1980, 30% for 
males down 18% for females. That's a good portent of what's going to happen, of course, because the future depends on entry-level jobs. Well, that's unskilled laborers, lab workers, meaning most of the workforce that's been harmed. Uh, for the college-educated, it all started going down around 1787. But there's a sector that's uh, 1987, sorry, wrong century, but in the right year. Uh, the, uh, uh, the same has been happening to the never very substantial welfare systems. The U.S. was always low in the, in the global, in the industrial world in welfare systems, but they've been going way down in the last 20 years. Uh, AFDC, which is the big one that everyone talks about, which was never very big, uh, has dropped about almost close to half between uh, the 70s and 1990. Now it's gone. That was the big achievement. Uh, but it had fallen very sharply over 20 years. Uh, that means that another six million children of average age seven uh, can learn responsibility because they won't be uh, trapped by welfare dependency any further. And there are big effects of this too. You know, you destroy support systems, you eliminate daycare, you force two parents out to work longer and longer hours uh, just to keep food on the table. It's not hard to figure out what the effect of that is. There's a destruction of family life, uh, terrible effects on children, you know, latchkey children, abuse of children and by children and so on. That's actually pretty well documented. There was a UNICEF study, big UNICEF study, that came out two years ago uh, on child care in rich societies. Usually they study poor societies. The author is a well-known American economist, Sylvia Ann Hewlett. I have yet to see a review of it anywhere, except in something I wrote in Z Magazine. Uh, but uh, what she points out is that there's two different, that the round nine, starting with 1980, the industrial societies just split into two different patterns. There's what she calls an, there's an Anglo-American model, Reagan and Thatcher, carrying the other, you know, Canada and Australia and so on, somewhat along with them. And there's a European Japanese model. They were all facing the same problems. You know, they're all facing the same global economy, but they just pick different ways of dealing with it. The Anglo-American model simply cut support systems, drove people into the workforce, cut down parent-child contact time, uh, and with the effect that it was, as she puts it, a disaster for children and families. The European Japanese model following facing the same problems was much more supportive and the effects are very different and you measure them by infant mortality and nutritional rates and educational level and everything else well that's pretty dramatic and clear and to be expected uh, interestingly this attack on families and children has been carried out under the rubric of family values and they've gotten away with it and that's another real testimonial to the uh, 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 to the educated culture that we live in. Uh, well, I don't want to exaggerate. Business does have its problems, and it's complaining about them. So Business Week, again, has pointed out that business is not likely to reach uh, the profit growth rate of the last quarter of 1994, 71% profit growth. They're kind of not likely to hit that one again very soon, so that's kind of sad. Uh, another uh, problem is reported in a Business Week headline, which reads, Problem Now, What to Do with All That Cash? Uh, as surging profits are overflowing the coffers of corporate America and dividends are booming, uh, thanks in large measure to profits from overseas operations. That's really meaning, you know, you export jobs. Uh, well, you know, pretty sad. Not all peaches and cream for those guys who... Uh, social policy is uh, showering goodies on. Uh, now, the, sta uh, the standard line is, uh, and you hear it over and over, that these are just lean and mean times. You know, everybody's got to tighten their belts. You just can't afford those things. Uh, uh, you know, we're not rich enough to do this. We all got to suffer together. That's complete and total cynicism. The country is just overflowing with capital. Uh, the problem is exactly what Business Week says it is, what to do with all that cash. Uh, the, uh, uh, th that's the problem now. There is no problem of lean and mean times. This is just class war, straight out class war. Lean and mean times for you guys, but not for me. We're just euphoric about the uh, profits pouring out of our pockets. Well, without going further, let's put this in a little bit of perspective. 
Uh, for, striking fact to bear in mind is there's nothing new about this. It's happened repeatedly in the past, and the ways out are known from what happened in the past. So go back to, say, the First World War. Uh, right at the time of the first, the United States has a very violent labor history and a very brutal one, uh, incomparably worse than other industrial societies. Uh, but by the end of the First World War, there were big labor actions. Uh, they were smashed. The Wilson administration instituted the Red Scare, which destroyed uh, unions, destroyed the labor movement, pretty much crushed independent thought. It was a pretty brutal affair. Uh, it was very... It was hailed across the board by respectable people, uh, and, and uh, it was thought that a business rule was established in a way which was expected to be permanent. Uh, it was a kind of utopia of the masters, you know, the end of history. Uh, I thought that's the end. Uh, it's uh, not for the first time and not for the last time. Crucial aspect of it was indeed the destruction of the labor movement in what the leading labor historian in the United States, David Montgomery of Yale University calls the fall of the House of Labor in a most undemocratic America, speaking of the 1920s. Now, the undemocratic America is both a cause and a consequence of the fall of the House of Labor. Uh, with all of its flaws, uh, the working class movements, which are grassroots popular movements reflecting large parts, in fact, the majority of the population, they have always been, with all their flaws and everything bad you can say about them, a popular force, a ma the major popular force probably for social justice. So that's a result of the undemocratic America, but also a cause uh, for it. Uh, this was 1920s where the automobile boom, you know, the big growth of industrial production. During that period, uh, there were virtually no working no rights for working people. This amazed foreigners, even right-wing foreigners, uh, who, like the right-wing British press, was appalled by the treatment of American workers. Uh, Australian visitor commented correctly that in the 1920s that labor organization exists only at the tolerance of employers, uh, 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 and uh, uh, the working people have no real part in determining industrial conditions, which is quite unusual, and as I say, that was thought to be the end of history, permanent. Well, a couple of years later, there was vigorous and militant uh, popular mobilization, which brought about quite substantial changes. In fact, it brought the United States into the world of the industrial societies in the 1930s. It compelled Washington to divert some public resources, at least, to the general public, which is, you know, what's called the welfare state. Well, roughly speaking, that with some oscillations, that continued from the 1930s until right through the Nixon administration. Uh, during that period, the United States was, in comparative terms, more or less within the industrial world in this regard. Now, the, uh, that move in the mid-30s, the New Deal measures, that elicited a very strong reaction on the part of the shadow that the substance that casts the shadow on a part of the business community, which is very class conscious in the United States. Uh, you read the business press right after the passage of the Wagner Act in 1935. It's warning of what it called the hazard facing industrialists and the rising political power of the masses. Uh, and warned that unless their thinking is redirected, we're going to be heading for adversity. And a big campaign was undertaken in the late 1930s to fend off this hazard. Uh, well, the war put it on hold. It was picked up again right after the war, very powerfully, a huge intensification of the propaganda war. Uh, the scale of it is pretty astonishing. In fact, the first scholarly work on this just appeared, sort of known that it took place, but the scale is really kind of mind-boggling. Uh, and it was very conscious. The leaders of the public relations industry and the business community uh, described their problem. They're, they're, they've got three to five years to save the system, to get back what they want. Uh, they, have to, they have to wage the everlasting battle for the minds of men and indoctrinate people with the capitalist story fast and quickly to ensure that democracy doesn't spread and that the government will continue its historic role to protect the minority, the opulent against the majority. Very explicit. And it, the scale was incredible. Uh, so, for example, everything was targeted, say schools. But by the early 1950s, about a third of the materials used in schools were straight business propaganda. Uh, universities, churches, uh, 
everything down to recreational activities and sports leagues were organized and controlled to be part of business propaganda. There's a cap the Taft-Hartleyville in 1948 gave business the right to propagandize workers in a captive audience, namely in the workplace. And that was used very extensively. Uh, business propaganda, trade propaganda films were reaching maybe 20 million people a week. Uh, in addition to that, the vast resources of the huge public relations industry and entertainment industry were mobilized with very specific purpose, uh, demonized unions, in fact, any democratic uh, structure, uh, glorify what was called Americanism and harmony and, you know, we're all together and keep those disruptive elements like union leaders and activists out of our happy lives. Uh, another part of the corporate offensive, which is having a big effect right now, uh, was developing what's now called anti-politics, that is setting up the government as the enemy. Make people don't like what's happening, but make them pe focus their attention on the shadow, not the substance. Uh, so you want to you're angry about what's going on, blow up a federal building. You know, don't blow up a corporate headquarters. Look at the shadow, not the substance. That's the mood of anti-politics. Now, there's a lot that's wrong with the government. In fact, most of that is traceable to the fact that it is the shadow cast by big business over society. Uh, but uh, that's not the reason why the government is hated. It's hated because it's potentially democratic, because people can participate in it and do something about it. Well, that mood is now very substantial. I need not talk about it. Uh, the popu the, by the end of the 1950s, it looked like the corporate offensive had won. There was, again, all sorts of you know, delight about uh, the end of ideology and it's all over, utopia of the masters, and so on. Dramatically wrong. The 1960s, again, changed everything. That led to an even more intense reaction. Uh, we're now back into the 1970s, a huge corporate offensive, now abetted by new factors in the global economy. There's no doubt of that. Uh, no time to talk about them. I've just been informed, but they're real. But they're not inevitable. Uh, they can be dealt with in all sorts of ways. <clears throat> the population doesn't like it, overwhelmingly. Over 80% of the population doesn't even think we have a democratic system. That's a huge uh, amount who thinks that the government just doesn't function for the population, works for a few in the special interests. Over 80% of the population thinks that the economic system is inherently unfair, and so it runs case by case. Uh, there's a lot of fraud about this. If there were time, I would go into it, but there isn't unless you want me to say something about it. Well, I just want to stress one thing about all this, which is the most important thing to bear in mind, and that is it has happened over and over again. Uh, 200 years ago, uh, at the founding, right after the, the framework was established, uh, James Madison, who did not like the consequences of what he saw he had done, remember the design was to protect the minority, the opulent against the majority, and it was designed that way. But his picture, his naive belief, was that the minority, the opulent, who would be protected against the threat of democracy would be nice, benevolent gentlemen and would use their power to make sure everyone was happy. Well, he quickly discovered by the 1790s that that was not true, uh, and he denounced what he called the daring depravity of the times as these rising business classes became the tools and the tyrants of government bribed by its largesses and overawing it with their powers and combinations. That is, using its power, first of all, controlling it, but also benefiting by its power to transfer resources into their hands. Uh, that's a pretty good description of what's happening now and has happened pretty much ever since. Uh, the, uh, uh, since that time, since the 1790s, there have been all sorts of oscillations. There have been long periods of popular struggle. There have been plenty of successes. It's a much more civilized country than it was in many ways. There have been defeats now and then, periods when, it, when the end of history was very happily proclaimed. That was true 100 years ago. It was true again in the 1920s. Dramatically, it was true again to some extent in the 50s. Each time, there has been a great joy and applause for the you know, the finality and perfection of the uh, daring depravity of our times. Each time it has been wrong, uh, 
and it's been wrong each time because people simply refuse to sit there and accept the conclusion that this is inevitable and it's an iron law and you can't do anything about it, some kind of inverted Marxism of some sort. Uh, the same is true today. Uh, these are human decisions in human institutions. They can be changed, as they've often been changed in the past, and if this time it turns out that uh, uh, the daring depravity of the times is permanent, uh, we don't have anyone to blame for that but ourselves. Thanks. Good evening, Noam. Hi. My question is, when you're offered two choices by the same crowd, I'd like to hear you comment on what I believe is real critical. That is, we did have this big Conference of the States movement, and you had the right come out and say, no, this is wrong, we want the Constitution, and now you have this Federalist movement. You mean back 200 years ago? Oh, yeah, right, they're yeah. bringing, right. And now there's this Federalist movement, and they're currently meeting, I mean, I think it started yesterday for the next couple of days. It's the same group, it's the same answer. Can you comment on what's happening? Uh, well, you know, the, the choice between more federalism or uh, more centralization it doesn't mean anything in the abstract. There are conditions under which I think devolution, you know, lowering decision-making down to the local level, for that matter, would be a very good thing in eliminating centralized authority. But there's a very special condition under which that is a democratizing element when there's no private tyranny around. If, if you've got a king in a feudal system uh, and you eliminate the only counter to them, you're going to be in trouble. Uh, now, uh, and, that's the tr and the point is that most of this stuff is just irrelevant. It's tinkering with formalities while the same substance keeps throwing the shadow that is politics. Well, in that case, there happens to be among all the institutions one around which uh, could, to some extent, in fact, confront uh, private tyranny and is, at least in principle and sometimes indeed in practice, susceptible to public pressure. That's the federal government. Under those conditions of highly undemocratic organization, it's very dangerous to uh, eliminate federal power. I mean, like, you know, I personally, I'm just, I, I see the dilemma for myself because I'm against centralized power in principle and in favor of it in these circumstances because the only way to protect people against even worse centralized power. Uh, and unless that issue is faced, we're basically talking irrelevancies. It doesn't matter what kind of a, a formal arrangement you make. Um, um, is there another mic yes. way back? Yeah, okay. Yes. I was wondering if you could speak to um, the issue of racial polarization, which appears to be a growing um, issue in this country, and specifically, uh, more recently, the issue of the Million Man March, which also created further polarization, and what, uh, what you think that means and what, what's going on around that. Well, you know, if the Million Man March contributes further polarization, that's our fault not the fault of the people who took part in the Million Man March. There's actually no reason why privileged white people like most of us are should regard that as contributing to polarization. That's a form of popular mobilization. It's a fine thing, you know, uh, whether it works or not. Uh, 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 so, you know, again, it's like it, these are matters of, of decision and action. They're not matters of what it is, as if it's like something we're observing on Mars. Uh, as to the uh, racial polarization, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it, it, I mean, there are other things that are very similar to it. Take, say, the uh, growing fear and hatred of Jews in Germany, Jews and gypsies in Germany back in the late 1930s. That was a pretty frightening thing, and it led to some pretty ugly consequences. Uh, and uh, it had its sources. Uh, its sources were in part in genuine fears and concerns of a large part of the population, which were being misplaced to a, away from real enemies to enemies that are easy to hate and blame with consequences that we have seen. Uh, and that happens over and over again. Uh, in the United States, there happens to be a rather close, you know, not perfect, but close race-class correlation. Uh, and uh, the... Uh, uh, it's, 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 it's much 
easier to hate the guy next to you and say he's taking it away from me than to look at the real power. Uh, that's not just true of uh, uh, blacks and whites. So you go back a hundred years, uh, the working class was very racist, uh, but directed against Huns, meaning like Slovaks and Hungarians and people from Eastern Europe who were coming to these, you know, Anglo-Saxon and nice German areas and taking away their jobs. And that racism was severe, uh, as bad as the white-black racism. It was overcome in the course of common struggle. So, for example, when you get to the Homestead strike, you find that people cooperated and worked together. Same thing happened in the formation of the CIO in the 1930s. Black and white people were working together. They had a common struggle, a constructive goal. They saw who the real enemy was, and they were working together to overcome it. If you don't have those options, uh, people will turn, uh, will attack each other. Uh, they'll find uh, fraudulent objects of hatred and fear and anger, and they'll be easily manipulated to do so, displacing the real concerns and struggles that they ought to be carrying out against uh, vulnerable victims next door. Uh, that, those are great, easy things for demagogues to organize, and there's a popular, you know, there's, there's a, a, a ample terrain in which they can work. But again, you know, we know what this has been like in the past, we know the reasons for it, and you know how to combat it. Um, when you spoke in your lecture earlier about the corporate propaganda, which was used in textbooks in schools and recreational activities for children, and also the films, propaganda films. Could you be a little bit more specific about that? Well, if you want some details about it, there is a good study in, out now just a couple months ago. It's by a woman named Elizabeth Phones Wolf. It's called Selling Free Enterprise. It's a scholarly study with a lot of footnotes and stuff published by University of Illinois Press, who gives lots and lots of details. Uh, but the fact is the actual text materials in schools, the things that kids read, you know, and studied in the textbooks, about a third of them were pure business propaganda written by the public relations industry in order to create a certain type of person. And the, and this, uh, and the, type, and the same is true of advertising, of business propaganda, and indeed of films. So let's take one of the most famous films of the era. Uh, which at least people of my age all saw uh, on the waterfront with Marlon Brando. Big, you know, huge, uh, uh, spectacular success. What was the theme of On the Waterfront? Uh, for those of you, I suppose it's a number of, I don't know, maybe it's a different generation or something. <laughs> but anyway, in those days, huge film, you know, big Hollywood success. Uh, the theme of On the Waterfront was uh, here's this, you know, these working people out on the dock somewhere. Uh, and they're being uh, exploited and, uh, you know, terrorized by these criminal union leaders, and everybody's afraid to do anything about it. And finally, one of them, the hero, Marlon Brando, uh, you know, gets a, he's going to fight back and good independent American type, not going to be pushed around, and despite all the powers of the union and so on, he finally stands up at the end and throws the union boss into the water and everybody cheers and everybody's happy. Uh, in other words, the image is uh, the union organizer is the enemy of the working man. Who's the friend of the working man? Well, you know, the hardworking executive who's toiling 16 hours a day for the benefit of everyone and the, you know, the banker who's trying to figure out a way to give you money so you can buy your house and so on. We're all one big happy family. You know, we're in harmony and togetherness and Americanism and so on. And then these intruders come in trying to destroy our happy lives, like by organizing people and so on. Uh, and, uh, you know, finally Marlon Brando gets up and kicks him in the face. Well, like any propaganda, no matter how grotesque, including Nazi propaganda, there's usually some level of realism behind it. You can't create effective propaganda out of zero. So there's something there, like there was a Jewish storekeeper who charged you too much money once. You know, there's usually something there. Uh, and there's something here, too. Uh, the un there, there were plen there's plenty of corruption in the unions. I mean, not a fraction of what there is in the private corporations, but plenty. So there's something there, and you make enough of a fuss about it, people see it, because it's real. You know, you can find it on the waterfront, you can find it anywhere else. Uh, but when that becomes the theme, and, you know, it's put into this framework, it just becomes part of a big propaganda system designed to make you subordinate yourself to private power. 
Uh, now, all of this stuff is going, uh, going on in everything from cartoons to comic strips to television to textbooks and so on and so forth, while the real structure of the society is being simply hidden. Like you don't read in your school books that the huge resources of the enormous public relations industry are dedicated to uh, fighting the everlasting battle of the minds of, for the minds of men and indoctrinating people with a capitalist story so they won't give us any trouble because we have to protect the, the minority, the opulent against the majority. And that all would be taught in elementary school in a, free, in a free society, but I doubt that many people have heard that in elementary school. Although it's all, you know, right at the core of our society. Uh, now, uh, the, the goal of all of this stuff is to subdue people, to isolate them, to make them just atoms of obedient consumption. You know, you sort of glued to the tube, it tells you what you want, you don't want it, but you figure you better want it, or you, you know, you're you worse than somebody else. So you, you work hard and you don't ask any questions, uh, and you do what they tell you because you need that stuff that they tell you you want, and you never talk to anyone else because, you know, they're down the street and people don't get together, you do things for yourself, and so on and so forth. Meanwhile, you believe that we have a free market. You, for example, you believe that it's, that, uh, the, the, the Republic, let's take a concrete case, that the Republican Congress is cutting the budget. That's not true. They're cutting part of the budget. In fact, they're cutting the part that people want. So they're cutting, and if you take a look at the things they're cutting, the population is overwhelmingly in favor of keeping them. Now, it does happen that the population is overwhelmingly in favor of cutting one thing, depending on budget. Uh, and that's going up. Uh, uh, there's another thing that's going up, and that's the state security system. So prison systems going up. The security systems of the state are going up. The public's opposed to it. That's the one thing that's going up. And there's a very simple reason for that. The, uh, the security system is going up because you have to have a technique of social cleansing. You've got to get rid of people who are in your way. The Pentagon is going up because that's what pours money into the pockets of rich people. A perfect example is Newt Gingrich, who's the biggest welfare freak in the country. Uh, he gets more federal subsidies for his super rich suburban district, Cobb County, than any suburban county in the country with the exception of the federal system itself. You know? Well, you know, it's a huge welfare freak. How does he get it? You know, he gets it through the Pentagon system. Actually, he gets it the same way I get my salary, you want to know the truth. MIT, where I teach, is part of the funnel by which the public pays the costs, of the research and development costs for high technology industry, and the profits then go into somebody's pocket. Well, you know, MIT is small potatoes, but uh, Lockheed Martin is not small potatoes, nor is Boeing, or is uh, the computer, nor is IBM, and so, or Microsoft, or any of them, and they feed off at the public trough. Uh, uh, there's no entrepreneurial values in Cobb County, uh, Georgia, where Newt Gingrich is from. There's just welfare dependency, extraordinary welfare dependency fueled through the Pentagon. So therefore, even though the Cold War is over and, you know, we no longer have to defend ourselves from the Russian hordes, uh, not only does the Pentagon budget stay about the same, but it's in fact going up. And it's the Heritage Foundation that says it's going up for exactly the reasons that the business community has always understood, namely, as you can read in the public business press back in the late 1940s, Fortune, Business Week, and so on, high-tech industry cannot survive in a competitive, unsubsidized, free enterprise economy, and the government must be the savior. And as the Secretary of the Air Force put it under Truman, the word to talk is not subsidy, the word to talk is security. That'll scare people into giving us the subsidy to keep private profit uh, increasing. Now, maybe it's a good thing to fund high technology. Okay, that's some, in a democratic society, that's something people would decide. But since there's great fear of a democratic society, what you have to do is scare people into paying for it and not telling them you're doing it. So in all the talk about welfare, even the talk about corporate welfare, which is rare, but there, nobody is talking about the biggest part of the corporate welfare system, namely the whole Pentagon system including NASA and the Department of Energy and so on, which is just a huge transfer system of payments from the general public to the pockets of the rich. And that's very crucial to the whole society. Like, you wouldn't have computers and the Internet and lasers and airplanes or anything else, uh, including the pharmaceuticals and the rest of it, if you didn't have these systems by which the public pays the costs and the profits go into private pockets. Well, you know, that's 
is not what the public relations industry is telling you. Like you don't see that in the television sitcoms every day. And you don't read it in the school texts that they're designing. In fact, you don't even study it in the universities, and you certainly don't read it in the newspapers. Uh, well, okay, that's what a good doctrinal system is like. Uh, so there's, you go on and on. You know, all you have to do is take a, turn on the tube and pick up tomorrow's paper you f and pick up your children's school books. You'll find plenty of examples. Um, you spoke of America's violent labor history past. I am familiar with, but I haven't been able to find much information on an incident in Colorado in around 1910, 1915, Ludlow somewhere Master. in there, when the National Guard was called out yeah. and American citizens were yeah. killed. It's all in all the labor histories. Okay. I mean, you can find an informal description of it in Howard Zinn's very valuable people's history. But you'll find it in any of the standard labor history. I just bought that last night, so. Yeah, it'll, it's, it's discussed in there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Actually, the, if you want some data on the violence of uh, American labor history, there is a good book on that specific topic. It's by Patricia K. Sexton. I forget what it's I think it's called The War Against Labor or something. Any, anybody remember? It came out a couple of years ago. It's just a scholarly study which points out that the dramatic distinction between American labor history and European labor history. In fact, if I remember her numbers, uh, during the early years of this century, I think about 700 American workers were killed by the security forces, killed by them, at a time when almost nobody was killed in Europe, even in right-wing countries. And in fact, as I say, the European press was appalled, right-wing press, London Times. You know. I don't think most Americans today are aware of that. I that went on into the late 30s. After, as late as the late 1930s, security forces were still murdering strikers. And that was just unknown in, in Europe. I think it's still large today. I think it's well, you know, now they usually don't go murdering strikers. But uh, there are individual cases, but this was a lot. Uh, and it's different. It's, you know, that was true up to the late 30s, I don't think, since then. Second part, um, I find... Uh, I admire you greatly because you say a lot of things, you confirm a lot of things that I have had vague intuitions about myself. And one thing in particular that strikes me is how many people also tend to feel the way, but nothing is happening, nothing is changing. What do you think? Right now. There seems to be a vacuum of leadership. What do you think? No, it's, it's not a vacuum of leadership. It's a vacuum of activism. Leadership comes along once you start doing something. Uh, once you, you start, look. Once you start doing something, somebody will come along and say, I'm your leader, you know. What? And then if you're smart, you'll say, no, you're not, you know. What but you do? that's where leadership comes from. So, for example, if you go back to the 1920s or the late 1950s, for that matter, it looked pretty much, certainly in the 1920s, just like it does now. Uh, and it's not that leaders came along and did something. It's that people did something. And they can do it now just like they could do it then. Um, and just like they've done it all through history, you know. I'm, I'm sorry, I was distracted. I was hoping to get yeah. some specific um, ideas on what, what how you to organize. Do. I mean, voting is not enough. It doesn't. No, seem uh, voting is just is a is picking you know one or another aspect of the shadow, may be useful or may not be useful. But there's nothing much to do with it. If you ask what you can do, the answer is you as an individual can do basically nothing, but you as part of a group can do a lot. So the first thing you do is find out what you're concerned with. There are a lot of things to be concerned with in the world. Find out which ones there are. Find out who's working on them. Join them and help them. And bring in other people to do it and find out more about things. Figure out other problems you ought to be worried about. You know, that's the way you can change things. That's exactly the way they've been changed forever. And, they can be, and the same you know, brilliant technique will work now. And if there's another one, nobody's ever figured it out in the last couple of thousand years. Uh, you uh, refer uh, repeatedly to private power, but I have a quibble with that. It, it seems to me that uh, corporations, I, I always say, well, where, after all, do these corporate charters come from? That's right. Haven't, in fact, these corporations been, I mean, at least since the East India Company, agencies of state That's administration? Right. That's right. This private power is totally illegitimate. It's granted by people like you and me through state charters, and it can be revoked. Now, in fact, up until the late uh, 18th, 19th century, up until around 100 years ago, charters were revoked. Uh, not, you know, it was frequent in the early part of the century. It was sparse toward the end of the century, but that power was still being used. It's only in this century that corporations have 
have won for themselves the authority, mostly through the courts, not through legislation, so not a little legislation about it. They have won the, they have instilled into people's minds the idea that they are permanent parts of the landscape with extraordinary powers. In fact, the powers of, uh, the powers of immortal persons, uh, even with things like freedom of speech that don't belong to institutions at all. You know. Uh, those are powers that they manage to gain for themselves just through force, essentially. And what you say is exactly right. There's, they're not there in law. Yeah, you can get together and revoke the charter of a corporation and take it over and make it, a, make it democratically controlled, in theory. Try to do it. If Part of that is that, mm -hmm. uh, I, for instance, the nonprofit corporations, mm -hmm. one reads about the heavy investments of, say, you name it, churches, MIT, universities, are, and retirement funds are heavily invested, and they don't want to see those private corporations go down either because that's their retirement yeah, Well, fund. see, they <laughs> invest, but remember the individuals who are, let's say, part of a pension plan or something, they have no say in any of this. It's true that formally speaking, if you're part of a pension plan, you're a you know, 0 0.000 something owner of General Motors, uh, but that tiny little fraction of your ownership is totally zero because the pension plan happens to be administered by you know, uh, a big investment firm or something and its managers and you don't even know where, what the money is. You know? So yeah, there are all sorts, I mean, there are all sorts of arrangements made uh, that's part of the genius of the system to ensure that this remains private power, although not because of, uh, you know, not because there's some foundation in economic necessity or for that matter even in law, just by institutional power and structure and the fact that people believe it. This is an old point, you know, because I'm David Hume 200 years ago and his foundations of the, uh, prince, in his principles of government, he ha he's, a, he's a conservative, you know, Tory. He asked the question, how come anybody obeys power? You know, he says, power is always in the hands of the people who are governed, not in the hands of the rulers. So how come it ever works? You know, why doesn't everybody just rise up and overthrow it? Yes. Well, he said, uh, it must be that in the most tyrannical or the most free societies, uh, the way it works is by control of opinion. If you can make people believe it's got to be this way and there are no alternatives and not perceive it and so on, okay, then you've won. Uh, that's more or less accurate. If you don't believe it anymore, it's gone. You know? Thank you. I mean, these are not, you know, it's not like the way the planets go around the sun or something. These are not laws of nature. These are institutional structures which exist as long as people sub submit themselves to them. And that's true of anywhere you, I mean, it's true of abusive family relationships. If a woman submits herself to it, it exists. If she doesn't, it can stop. First, you have to recognize that it exists, which is not so easy. The same is true of slavery, you know. The same is true of, and the same is true of uh, private tyranny and of everything else. No, there are structures of, to, there are totalitarian private structures that happen to have a state authorization, which could eliminate them if people were to use it. And in fact, uh, people could eliminate them even if they didn't have a state charter. Suppose they didn't have a state charter, you'd still eliminate them. Well, the fact exist, is, there's a, tech, there's a formal technique of doing it by revocation of charter, and there's a much more significant way of doing it by simply taking over the decision-making capacity. But, in, but if you look at the way they're functioning, they happen to be private tyrannies. And as long as people, ob 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 it's, it's like claiming, look, there really isn't any slavery because the slaves could go somewhere else and it's just the government. No, it's not just the government. It's a whole system of institutions which include all sorts of devices to force the slaves to submit, including doctrinal devices. And that's true here, too, dramatically. The formal fact that there happen to be state charters is correct, but irrelevant as long as people don't do anything about it. And if they don't, it's private power. So I think the word is right, and I'll continue to use it. Thank you. <laughs> Three. We're live. Okay, good. Um, I, I had one question, at, which is good. Um, and I'm concerned about Social Security and, and Medicare and Medicaid cuts. I think that's kind of a new addition to this, this cycle that you're talking about a lot. And I think a lot of people in this room, according to the studies, by the time we reach your age, aren't going to have anything. And if, it, if we do, it's going to be I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Why won't you have anything? Because with the baby boomers getting a little older. Oh, that's older, got nothing to do with it. I mean, it it, if you'll have something if the economy grows. It's I mean, all, Social Security is paid out of current 
income, not out of past income. If the economy keeps growing at a reasonable rate, there's no reason why people shouldn't have Social Security and medical care and so on. This is just scare nonsense. So it's, I just according to studies I've read, current income isn't yeah, going to be able to yeah. pay if you look at projections of this and that, you can prove anything. But the point is, if the economy sufficiently grows, you know, and, and there's a way to make the economy grow, namely by public spending, the way the economy grows is by having an educated, trained, skilled, healthy population with appropriate infrastructure and so on and so forth, that's the kind of spending that makes economies grow. So we don't need any cuts right now? No, in fact, I think we need increases. Uh, the, uh, the, I mean, there are, there are problems. Like, for example, medical payments are way out of sight, but that's because we have an inefficient medical system. If you had an efficient medical system, I mean, you know, Medicare, Medicare and Medicaid have been going up while other welfare is going down. But the reason for that is because the medical system is hopelessly inefficient, and the reason for that is it's privatized. So it has layer after, like when you pay a, a, your doctor bill, you're paying for profits, for advertising, for administration, for your bur bureaucracy, for paperwork. Those are huge costs. Uh, and you just don't have them in efficient systems, like national health care systems of a reasonable sort. So sure, if you have a highly inefficient bureaucratized system, costs are going to be out of sight. Uh, but the way to get rid of that is to make an, an efficient system that gives health care to people, not, profit, not profits to people. I mean, I, I don't want to make the question sound trivial. Like, there are questions to ask about the nuts and bolts of all of these things. But I've never seen any evidence there's any qualitative problem. You know, there are sort of technical problems about how to deal with this, that, and the other thing. And mostly they're met by economic growth. And in fact, the current spending cuts are cutting economic growth. So they are in fact exactly what is harming the potential for the future. Uh, you don't have, if you cut what economists call human capital costs, you know, getting healthy, educated, skilled people in a livable environment, you know, and so on and so forth, yeah, sure, you'll cut economic growth. And then there'll be a problem. I'm concerned with the, the law of nature as it relates to each individual human, and, and it seems that the growth of business is concerned with the, the ever-increasing bottom line. So Dostoevsky said that one sacred memory from childhood is perhaps the best education. The what? And the one sacred memory from childhood is perhaps the best education. And, and it seems that the sacred memories from, for, for our children are coming straight from the Simpsons or the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, and, and there's no effort to, to, to bring what the law of nature is or could be like through nature, <laughs> like through a visit to Glacier National Park or, you know, children grow up in a concrete society and there's no effort to bring to, bring to them any, any sort of balance. And, and uh, I hear a lot of economic talk and I hear a lot of, of, of number crunching, yet I still don't see any effort to, to de-economize our children's minds to, to be able to see it. Well, I don't know what the, I mean, let's take the question of letting your children live with nature. And there's a way to do that. That's to be rich and live in the suburbs. Then your, like, then your children live with nature. Is the su there's the another way of nature. doing it, and that is have public parks. And there's a way to do that. Instead of having 54% uh, profit growth for the Fortune 500 and having the problem being what to do with all that cash in the corporate coffers, you redesign society so that doesn't work like that and the, and the ample resources that are available are used to make public parks available to children. You know, the focus, that happens to be an economic issue, but it's but a way the to focus deal with to de-economize, um, like to to get kids out of the TV mentality, to, out of the TV mentality. Yes, out yeah. of the TV, television mentality, which is basically the socialization structure of of today's children, um, or or to this, this. You can't just get people out of the socialization structure. You have to construct alternatives for them. Yeah, well, well that's what I'm saying. Is like my kids, on. my kids never watch television. I mean, they watched it like a little bit because so, uh -huh. this wasn't part of their culture, you know. Uh -huh. and, and you encourage them not to, but they don't no, learn they that in school. They just had other things, you know. Well, look, but why should the schools train people to be free and independent and creative people who are going to challenge authority and so on? I mean, they will if we make the schools that way. But it's kind of like what the man before you said about corporations. I mean, in principle, we can make the schools free, liberatory, and so on and so forth. They're under our control. Uh, but you got to do it. Okay. Okay. Thank you.
Um, I just, first of all, thank you very much for uh, the work that you've done. I really appreciate it as a sociologist. And I just sometimes find myself enraged to the point of paralyzation by some of the things I hear you say. Um, for one thing, you know, to hear you speak of the Fortune 500 who are responsible for two thirds of the gross national product, Control and in the it. same, well, and in the same, in the same speech, be able to speak about the children that come to the hospital in Boston with distended bellies from malnutrition. Now, I work in a field where I work with abused children um, down in Eugene, and I work for Oregon Social Learning Center, and I work with children who are literally screwed by their parents, beaten by their brothers, um, molested, tormented, and really horribly, you know, treated badly, badly by their parents and their families. And so my field of study is going to be going into assisting children that are from the very families of which you speak. You know, do I heat the house? Do I feed the child? Or am, am I going to stay with this man who threatens me with a gun daily um, in order to stay in the home so I don't have to go to the homeless shelter where my child will inevitably be safer even amongst strangers? Now, you know, I was going to ask you what you thought I should do because I don't know, really, after hearing you speak and having all these things that you say, you give me this wealth of knowledge, this wellspring of information, and, and it's very difficult at times to come to a point where I can actually encompass one point as opposed to this broad spectrum of things that I think I possibly could do, you know, and well, you know, to look, what as, end? And look, you know? I, you're, I mean, everything you say is exactly right, and as a human being working with particular very serious problems, you've got a narrow scope of choices. Mm -hmm. Like in the framework that you've described, you're not giving yourself the choice of changing the social structure so that those conditions don't arise. But, on, but that's the answer. Short of that, you can put a Band-Aid on a sore. And you do it in the best possible me. way. I like, you know, Pardon? I said I didn't want you to just be like my guide and hold me by the no, hand. No, I mean, right? look, I, you know, I don't have anything to say yeah. that is not obvious. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's it, it, everyone is facing the even you're facing the problem because you're working with really hard, you know, important things. But everyone faces in some respect. If you accept, if the so, if the structure of the system remains unchanged, certain things will happen, and you can try to adjust around the corners to make it less harsh for people, and you should. It's important to do it, crucially. Like, you can help one child, you know, that's a tremendous contribution. Uh, but meanwhile, the system will stay like it is, and the next kid will come along. So while trying to help that one child, which is a marvelous thing to do, and if only more people would do it, we'd have a better world, apart from that, you want to change the system so it doesn't keep happening. And that nobody can do alone. That you can do by being parts of organizations of people who are dedicated to that. Uh, that's the way social change comes about. I mean, you know, take anything you like. Take, well, I mean, look, in the 1930s, American workers did finally get the rights they had in most of Europe. How? Not by people sitting alone and, you know, no television then, but listening to the radio. They did it by all the struggles that it took to build functioning labor organizations and other popular organizations, which finally rammed through the programs that they uh, uh, wanted. Why, why, why does Canada now, maybe not for long, but now uh, have a more or less efficiently, relatively efficiently functioning medical program as compared with us? Well, a large part of the reason is they had a functioning labor movement. Uh, up until around the 1960s, their system was very much like ours. Uh, then it changed. It changed largely because of, you know, not huge phenomena, an organized labor movement, a kind of a populist-based party which had a labor component which pushed through a reasonable provincial health system which was then duplicated elsewhere and succeeded. These are s small changes but with big effects on people's lives. And, uh, th and you cannot do those things alone. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Sorry, folks, but we can only take up so much of Professor Chomsky's evening, so that's going to have to be the end of it for tonight. Professor Chomsky, thank you.
in a sense, you don't really run out of oil. You change the costs. Okay. Uh, yeah, and or maybe you, you just use more expensive oil, or maybe you shouldn't be using oil. You want to know we're running out of trees this year? Well, places like the Nicaragua. And the reason is we have driven that country down to, through terror and, and economic warfare to such a level of poverty that people can't survive unless they go up into the hills and cut the trees. So the rivers are dying and the lakes are dying and so on, and maybe in a couple of decades it will be uninhabitable. But that's not because uh, there's too much use of trees. You know? That's because of actions and decisions that were made in which we had a big part. Yeah, but there's just too many people. I, mean, there's well, I don't know that there's too many I mean, people. Six million now, 12 billion by 2025. No, but first of all, it doesn't work like that. So take, say, Italy, you know, which used to have a huge population growth. It's now not, it's now the, act, the absolute population is declining. Okay, and it usually reflects these factors. It reflects the opportunities for women to control their lives in a reasonable fashion which means education and opportunities and, you know, breaking down authoritarian relations and so on. And that means that population growth is under social control. Because in America, if the Fed all went the other way, do you see any kind of critical mass where there can be so many disfranchised or marginalized people that... Um, Who knows? Nobody knows anything about those questions. I mean, you can't predict tomorrow's weather. You know, you can't certainly you can't can predict something it. as complicated as a human society. Yeah. But the point is, it's not the kind of thing you you care to predict one way or another about. What you do, you I mean, you see negative tendencies and try to stop them, whether they're sustainable or not sustainable. Thank you very much. But you know, the answer to the question is nobody knows. Just gonna stand here so people can see. Um, I'm a Palestinian. <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about Palestine tonight, but... It's um, okay. Glad to do it. <laughs> well, there are many questions. Yeah. But I was struck by your uh, response to many people upstairs when it came to the issue of what we need to do to change. And um, I feel that there is a leadership vacuum. And I know that you're saying that there is an activist vacuum. The problem is we don't have... We don't seem to have, like, a galvanizing body, uh, one that will point direction and really become the expressive voice where people feel a belonging to. And what I felt was missing when you said just go do something, because we all act, we all, I bet everybody here is involved in the community in one way or another. But why aren't we really picking up the pieces and do, <coughs> excuse me, doing change? Don't you think we do need some sort of a party or a leadership type of... Uh, well, there if, is a balance between the yeah, activism and... I mean, and if maybe a party would be a good idea, like I mentioned the NDP in Canada, but mm -hmm. which was... I didn't do anything different when it was in office from anyone else. But it was a popular-based party which brought together working people and people with environmental interests and feminists, in fact, anybody. And it was a kind of like a cover for them, and it meant that... Uh, actions could be for the public benefit. So for example, take say health care. Uh, uh, unions in the United States, better unions in the United States did get pretty good health care benefits for their members. So like the UAW got pretty good health care benefits for auto workers, but not for the general population. In, and the reason is that these were, you know, that the society here is sufficiently atomized so that even organized groups work for themselves, not for the public. Uh, in Canada, when the same labor unions worked for health care, they did it for the public, and they did it, in fact, through a party. Uh, but where did that party come from? Did it come because there was leadership? No, it came because people decided to get together and organize it. And once you get together and you, decide to, and, and you work to organize it, yeah, yeah, leaders will come along, and if you're serious, you won't let them get too much power. Uh, and I, I just, I, you know, it would be nice if there was some other, where would a galvanizing vision come from? Well, from the people who are working for things. Where, where did a galvanizing vision come from for the civil rights movement in the United States? <coughs> did it come from any leaders? No. It did not come from leaders. It came from uh, kids, work, uh, freedom riders and snake workers and kids out there every day. And out of that came a vision which later somebody came along and could articulate. And that's the way everything works. I mean, where did the take Palestinian society? Where did the Intifada come from? Well, it came from the people, but there was yeah, also a balance right. between an organized form and a where spontaneous was the organized form. form. 
it was in the PLO. What no, you, but what, it wasn't. You know, the, I mean, I don't know if you were in, where were you at that time? I was here at that yeah, time. Okay, well, you know, if you were over there, you could see it was not coming from the PLO. I went through West Bank. No, no, it wasn't coming from the PLO. I hated the PLO. That's right, yeah. me too. Uh, but, but it was, <laughs> I mean, they, uh, I was astonished to see the hatred. Yeah. It was coming out of, you know, a whole, and in a sense it came out of the PLO, because the PLO had been responsible, kind of inadvertently, for the development of a network of organizations of various kinds. It was partially responsible for that. And out of those organizations, yeah, it came sort of, you know, nothing is spontaneous. So there was a progression. Pardon? There was a progression, and, and I agree with you. Yeah, but it's just that it wasn't I, from the leadership, which was... In that particular case, off. no. Yeah. Okay, but I think that the case is typical. Mm. I mean, you know, it has its own particularities, and every case is different from every other mm. case, but I think that it's mostly like that. Mm. Uh, uh, visions come from people who think through the problems ahead of them and work together with other problems to get people to get a better <coughs> vision. And from gains and achievements and failures and learning from the failures and so on. As far as I know, that's been true of everything. Yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, uh, there'll be plenty. Of, if, if you have an effective enough uh, uh, campaign and program and achievements and so on, there'll be plenty of people to come by and say, I'm your leader. They're happy to do that. <laughs> Thank you. One of the very few predictions that has ever been proven valid in the social sciences, as far as I know, and ought to be studied just for this reason alone, uh, is an analysis by Bakunin, you know, uh, back around, I forget when, about the middle of the 19th century, uh, when he predicted that the there was a kind of a rising, a new class, he called it a new class, in fact, of intellectuals who were different than, you know, the old priests and so on. And they were just part of developing industrial society. And he predicted that the new class of more or less professional intellectuals would, by and large, break up into two categories. Uh, there would be one category, who he called uh, the red bureaucracy, it was long before, he was talking about early Marx, way before Lenin. They would be the red bureaucracy, and they would, uh, you, they would exploit popular struggles to take power in the name of the people. Uh, after which they would construct the most brutal and repressive systems in human history of all in the name of the people. That's one path. He said there'll be another path uh, of same kind of people, maybe the same ideals, who just have a different analysis of the situation and see that power actually lies in what we would nowadays call state capitalist institutions, we can call it that. Uh, and they would recognize that the way to gain power is to work for them. Hmm. and beat the people with the people's stick, as he put it in what are called democracies, but being basically the commissars for the for those groups of power. Well, that's the liberal intellectuals or, you know, something like that. Uh, that prediction came, and that prediction came out rather true. Uh, and I think uh, uh, we see it every day in the ease of transition from one category to another. Do you see a danger Absolutely. to democracy? Yeah, I mean, I think that the United States is in a very strange state at the moment. I mean, it's always been a kind of an odd society in a lot of ways. But right now it's a very strange. I mean, the, the uh, if proliferation of fanatic cults is extraordinary. And it's on any topic you want. You know? I mean, I know perfectly well I could go to, I could come to any city in the country and give a talk and a lot of people would come out in which I tell them, look, the real thing that's going on is that... Uh, you know, Bill Clinton is a vampire. He's <laughs> controlled by forces from Mars, and he's sucking the blood of children, and that's why everything can go on and on, and that's why everything's wrong. And probably people would stand up and applaud and say, and if you think that's an exaggeration, I wish it were. Uh, but, you know, the, the point is people are so, dis are, you know, are, this, the society's kind of dissolved. You know, social bonds have collapsed. People are isolated. People aren't even joining bowling leagues. You know, when you get to a state, that's literally the case, when you get to the state in which over 80% of the population thinks there's just no functioning political system, and you know, cynicism about institutions keeps going up, and you hate everybody, you're afraid of everybody, and you're alone, and, and so on, you know, people react in some fashion. They don't just sit there in no fashion. And one of the ways in which people react in such circumstances is... Uh, by millenarian cults and messiahs and uh, crazed beliefs and religious fanaticism and so on and so forth. 
Uh, that's uh, very typical of uh, devastated societies. You know, like it was kind of true of Europe after the Black Plague or the devastated peasant society. Actually, something similar is going on in the Islamic world. Uh, so, like uh, with this Palestinian, I don't see him anymore. But you know, as he could tell you better than me, uh, what, what? Why is Hamas getting power in uh, in you know in the uh, Palestinian areas? Well, secular nationalism collapsed in part the PLO, in part through its own corruption and dishonesty, but in part just because of the powers that were used to demolish it, of which the United States was the strongest. Well, you know, when secular nationalism, secular nationalist options collapse or are destroyed, people just don't say, okay, I commit suicide. They turn to something else. Uh, and one of the other things they rather typically turn to is, is religious fundamentalism, uh, which offers people things, and in fact often even offers them services. You know, like honest, not corrupt social services combined with fanatic messages. And, you know, a vision of the future that they can hope for. Uh, now, the United States is probably the most fundamentalist country in the world, or certainly close to it. I suspect if you actually did a study, it's probably more than Iran. You know? And I think it's partly a reflection of uh, the dissolution of social bonds and of a conception of constructive alternatives. Uh, and it's a very frightening fact. Um, no doubt about it. You know, those those institutions that we're also cynical about. Well, well, well wait a second. I think I it's only fair to push the line and sorry. let people, uh, these people have been waiting on Yeah. No, it's just not fair. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Professor. I'm sorry, but we really have to wrap it up at this Do point. Have... The building closes at 10, it's 10 o'clock. I'm terribly sorry for the folks in line, but securities. <laughs>